Welcome everyone as everyone starts logging on. I'm Heather Anderson, CEO of Global Health Corps. Thanks for joining today. This is the Beyond Imposter Syndrome event. So we're gonna join in just five minutes and make sure everyone can join us. So stay tuned. In the meantime, um, if you can, I encourage you to turn on your video and um, also feel free to let us know in the chat where you're calling in from. Hi, Vicki. Thanks for joining. Hi. Thank you. Again, hi, everyone. As you continue to join, welcome. We're going to be starting at five after, after the hour. This is the Beyond Imposter Syndrome. We've got an amazing panel of women today. So it's going to be an excellent hour. Feel free to put in the chat where you're calling in from. I am here in Brooklyn, New York. It's really cold. I hope some of you are in places that are warmer. Oh yeah, California sounds great. Nashville, excellent. Yes, Belinda, I bet it is cold in Rochester. What a great crew. Hi, Betsy Fuller. All right, I see lots of screens still popping up. For those that don't know me, I'm Heather Anderson. I'm the CEO of Global Health Corps. I'm gonna host things this morning. Was well, this morning, I guess, almost lunchtime here in New York. It's probably lots of different times for all of you joining around the world, but we'll be starting just in a couple of minutes. So thank you again for joining. Feel free to let us know where you're calling in from. And if you're able to show your video, we'd love that too. All right, we're gonna get started in just one minute. So thanks again for everyone joining. Appreciate you joining on time. And we're gonna get started. And yes, last, feel free to, if you haven't put in where you're calling in from, um, please feel free to do that. I love it. We've got Laui, Bulgaria, Mexico. Oh, this is amazing. This is really exciting. I really appreciate everyone taking the time out of your day to join us. Yes, okay. I think this is a good crew. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So again, hello everyone um, and welcome. I am Heather Anderson. I'm the CEO of Global Health Corps. And today we have the honor of hosting a conversation on the real and persistently evergreen topic of closing the gender gap in global health leadership. Specifically, we'll be discussing how the current use of the concept of imposter syndrome can really limit progress. You know, as you're thinking about this event and thinking about my own leadership journey as a female leader, you know, it's a time when Positions, leadership positions are still overwhelmingly male. We know that uh, less than 25% of top leadership positions in global health are women. And then that goes all the way down to 5% if you're talking about low and middle income countries. Um, when I think back to sort of earlier in my career, um, I started out in the private sector, you know, I would definitely 
have categorized myself as very green, um, not entirely sure what I was doing, probably ripe with imposter syndrome. But I also would have seen myself, you know, and did see myself as results oriented, strong, comfortable sharing my perspectives and opinions. You know, leadership qualities, I think, often have been described as masculine. Um, but in doing so, you know, I had no shortage of obstacles. Um, this included a time when my boss in my performance review put down that I was too ambitious and that I needed to tone it down. Um, because it turns out that being competent and confident uh, wasn't really enough to close the gender gap in leadership for women. And so then, you know, sort of fast forward a bit, when I think really now for sort of the last 10 years in my career at Global Health Corps, you know, I've also really focused more and really learned a lot more about the importance of traits typically seen as feminine, such as compassion, empathy, vulnerability, to be able to listen, to show emotion, to care for each other. You know, these are the traits that I really needed to lean into as a CEO, especially during a pandemic when it has pushed all of our boundaries for resiliency. And so when the conversation about imposter syndrome takes over, it often ignores how important these leadership traits are, that they're signs of strength, not weakness. So today we're shifting the focus away from the narrative that women are solely responsible for overcoming the imposter syndrome. And that really we wanna have a conversation that is a narrative that centers making systemic changes that allow women to thrive in leadership. So, you know, I'm really proud that, uh, you know, I have the opportunity and privilege to lead an organization that strives to equip the next generation of leaders to advance equity at the intersection of health and gender. I'm proud that 64% of those leaders are women and that their male counterparts uh, get to learn from them daily and vice versa. I'm also proud that within GHC, so many teams are led by women and men who break the bias daily about what leadership really looks like. So let's move on to today's panel, which I'm really excited about. Um, first of all, I'm thrilled to introduce the author and activist, Jamia Wilson. Jamia is our moderator for today's conversation. And I have the privilege to meet Jamia. You were just talking about it. And I think it's close to 20 years ago um, when I started my career in global health at Planned Parenthood. She brings a combination of fierce intellect, warmth, candor, clarity, and amazing storytelling chops to all of her impactful roles from serving as VP and executive editor at Random House to publishing clarion calls for changes in dozens of media outlets to inspiring young activists with her own books. We're honored to have her here with us today and over to you, Jamia, thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you for sharing your powerful story with me. I can't believe it's been 20 years, but it's been so wonderful to watch your ascension and tremendous leadership. And I am a big fan of the work of Global Health Corps. So I'm just really honored to be here today. I'm really happy we're talking about this topic because uh, as someone who looks a bit younger than my actual age, I've heard people have said this to me um, since I started in the workforce, you know, I've always been um, described as a baby face to a lot of people and I think it's genetic. My dad is in his seventies and people think he's, you know, close to the age I am now often. And um, I, really experienced this feeling of being in rooms where I felt like I needed a name tag that said not the intern or what my job actually was because people would assume that I was just starting out or I'd just come out of college and coupling that with other kinds of feelings of coming in new, being green on a new job um, allowed me to feel as if sometimes I didn't belong or that I needed to show people that I deserve to be there. And so for me, the reason I'm happy we're having this conversation is that I had mentors and supporters, including my late mom, who really imbued in me uh, a sense of really deeply knowing and focusing on understanding that I arrived where I 
am and the roles that I'm in for a reason, for skills that I possess, for work that I have done, for connections I have built with other great people on teams over the years, and to really think about what it means to own that, no matter what other people around you think, but what it means to own that, embody it, and to really believe it. And for me as a humor person, I love jokes and the darker the humor, the better. I would sometimes make it a joke. So um, I would say one example from my own life is when I was first running the feminist press, which is the press I was able to helm before my position at Random House, joy of a lifetime, first woman of color and youngest director in 50 years. And when I came into that position, I had a moment of thinking, oh my God, first woman of color, youngest director in 50 years, when I applied, I did not think they were going to give me the keys to the car, especially when at that time their 90 year old founder was there who had been there throughout the entire journey, welcoming me on. And so I had a moment of thinking about that when I was in a meeting and making a point about something from a generational perspective uh, and kind of deciding to own it and saying, yes, I see that we might disagree on X or Y issue, but I also saw in the meeting minutes from 1980 that we were still debating that then. So maybe now is the time for us to talk about doing it a new way. And that made everyone really laugh, including some of the people who um, had started out before saying, oh yes, I could technically be your great grandmother. And isn't it amazing that we're working together? So I just share that to say that sometimes those things that we might think are our weaknesses are actually our strengths and precisely that new and fresh perspective I was able to bring was the right perspective and was a part of their intentional um, selection uh, and taking a chance on someone who was new to book publishing I had done online media publishing at that time and it really just showed me the other things I can learn with strong mentorship and connection and community, but these parts that are intrinsically a part of me and what I bring, they need that and I need to own it. So I'm just happy to share that and to now go into our conversation and connect more deeply with these amazing speakers. So our conversation today is inspired by a Harvard Business Review article. It was penned by Rushika Tulishian and Jody N. Beery last year. And they explain that, quote, imposter syndrome puts the blame on individuals without accounting for the historical and cultural contexts that are foundational to how it manifests in both women of color and white women. Imposter syndrome directs our view towards fixing women at work instead of fixing the places where women work. For many women, and especially women of color and women at the intersection of other historically marginalized identities, simply being told to be more confident can be neutral at best harmful at worst. And when we think about advancing gender equity at top levels of leadership in many sectors, including global health, the stats are dismal, as Heather shared. So, so how do we get serious about changing that? And that's what excites me about this conversation. A mindset shift from a sole focus on helping women increase their skills and their confidence to actually removing the barriers at the organizational and societal levels that we encounter is key. And that means that we all, we can all have all the women's empowerment initiatives in the world, and we're still not going to see gender parity and leadership. And especially not with women of color being proportionally not being represented. So if we don't start also prioritizing with more of a systemic approach, then we're not going to achieve our overall goal. But programs like Global Health Corps are important interventions precisely because they go beyond women's empowerment to take an ecosystem approach to equity. I mean, we see that right now. That one is one of the things I loved as I saw all of your boxes coming up and all the time zones thinking, oh, this is an ecosystem. We're in every hemisphere right now having this conversation. It matters that the majority of GHC leaders are women and most are people of color. And it matters that these women are able to access gender specific programming to overcome obstacles to leadership, but also that they become a part of a broader community with shared commitment to equity at all levels. It also matters that the network is mixed gender because that means male leaders in the GHC community are also trained to apply an intersectional lens to their health equity work. And we know that training up more male allies in how to understand and shift power dynamics and to challenge patriarchy is critical. 
And finally, it matters that GHC is not just building the confidence and skills of individual women, but providing platforms for them to advocate with others. To, we're stronger together for gender equity at the organizational and the societal levels too. So without further ado, I'm excited to welcome our speakers, three GHC alumni who are going to drive this conversation and dive into it with their brilliance. Caroline Numuhire, did I pronounce that right? I wanna make sure I did, is an author, advocate and community builder who hails from Kigali. Caroline was a 2014 and 2015 GHC fellow at Gardens for Health International. She also led programs for GHC and for Siegel Family Foundation and has published several novels, A Woman After My Own Heart, Challenging Cultural Expectations for Professional Rwandan Women. It is hard to write a novel. I have not done that yet. So I'm just taking off a chapeau to you right now. That's amazing that you've published several. Lemise Williams is a Jamaican-American gender equity advocate and academic. She is currently Gender Integrational Specialist 2 at Encompass LLC and serves as an adjunct lecturer at her alma mater, Howard University in Washington, DC. I am also a former bison, go bisons. Lanice was a 2016-2017 GHC fellow and is currently the co-chair for Women in Global Health's DC chapter. And Musanda Chikwanda is a Zambian gender equity advocate with a focus on promoting the advancement of girls and women in science. Also passionate as the daughter of a woman scientist. I just love this. I wish you could see this right now. She is currently the African Girl Up Regional Manager at the United Nations Foundation and was a 2017 through 2018 GHC Fellow. What phenomenal women. I'm so proud to be with them and lucky to be surrounded by their radiance. And as they're speaking on a vulnerable topic, I encourage you to all show them support, share your snaps of agreement, share any questions coming up for you in the chat, share your love. And we'll have time for audience Q&A in just a bit, and we'll gather all of the comments and the questions. So please keep them coming. Even though we're in a square right now, let's envision that we're really in a circle. We are all connected. And as one of my mentors, Gloria Steinem always says, we are linked and not ranked. So with that spirit, we are going to start our conversation. So you're all rising women leaders in global health. In what ways do you think the concept of imposter syndrome has threatened to hold you back? Can you recall a time when you were told that you needed to overcome your imposter syndrome, thus taking attention away from the broader issues at play? Let's start with you, Lanice. So in an org, there should, there should be more support for women to address work dynamics, the systemic issues we talked about before. Do they feel like they're experiencing imposter syndrome because of poor management, an environment that isn't inclusive, not feeling valued, a lack of clear feedback? These all need to be addressed through diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at the organizational level. So tell me more. Um, so I would say, I wouldn't say there was ever a time I was told I needed to get over my imposter syndrome. I would say a moment of transparency. Imposter syndrome is something that I'm currently navigating and been dealing feelings with for probably like the past two months. I feel like when it really comes to address, addressing imposter syndrome, it's really not just on that person. It's really addressing a lot of systemic change within society, within or an organizational level, just really making sure that women feel valued, feel appreciated, feel welcome within an organizational culture. I say, especially for women of color, it kind of goes back to what Heather said earlier, like, you know, in her role when she got feedback on a performance assessment, she was told like, oh, maybe I should like dial it back. And I really feel like organizations should make space for women to be themselves. They shouldn't feel less than, there shouldn't be anything that's arising within an organization that should make them question their skills and their capabilities. But really thinking about, particularly if you're supervising someone and if your staff comes to you and say, hey, you know what, I find myself, I'm second guessing myself, I feel like I'm having um, imposter syndrome, really truly addressing and talking with them, walking through, is that providing mentorship or 
providing some form of professional development opportunity, whatever it might be to really make them know that I'm appreciated, I'm a value, really taking um, not only a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion lens, but really using a very much so intersectional approach to addressing it, because we know as women, we all have various intersecting identities as well. Thank you so much, Lanice. And I can really connect with all of that. And if you are in the chat and you feel like you can connect too, we wanna to hear from you. So definitely add if this resonates with you because it definitely did with me. And then Musanda, how about you? Tell us a little bit more about what needs to change. And can you recall being told that you needed to overcome imposter syndrome? And what are the issues that really needed to be addressed? Uh, thank you so much, Jamia. Uh, for me, I think at society level, there is need to be more of uh, there is need to be more of uh, embracing women and speaking up. Um, I have often been trying to also navigate with my own ambition and expectations of um, an older majority male group, and just having grown up uh, in a conservative environment in Zambia. I've experienced tension between respecting elders in rooms and also standing up as a woman. And also having worked with my organization for the past four years, I believe it's important that girls understand how they can advocate for themselves. And most importantly, I feel like young people also need to see role models or people who look like them to kind of motivate and make them envision themselves in the places that uh, they feel that they should not be. Um, they of course need to do this in a you know in a skillful way, uh, knowing that norms and culture are a challenge and also. Uh, it may disrupt the fact that they're trying to get a message across that is advocating for their rights and as well as their well-being. Thank you so much. And I love that this conversation is being in the context of the intergenerational is just really feeling that and how this is ongoing work that we can do and do together as we also um, change our position within it. Um, I just realized in a group that I have volunteered for for almost 20 years. Whenever I hear that 20 years, I'm just thinking, what? I can actually say that? Um, that I have now moved from the young women's circle into the bridge generation, bridge leaders group. And we're now mentoring the next generation of young leaders and um, really just learning to embrace that. It feels really good while we're also being mentored by the elders who are mentoring those of us who are not where they are about 20, 30 years ahead. So thank you so much for your remarks. And then also Caroline, um, tell us a bit about your experience. Can you recall a time you were told that you had to overcome imposter syndrome? What kinds of systemic issues did you wish were being addressed? Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, this is such an important uh, conversation to me uh, because uh, like, and also like uh, for everyone feeling like imposter syndrome uh, from one day to another, it's really like because we are, we are, we are brave enough to take spaces that are not traditionally reserved for women and we are shaping history and I think sometimes that that's also like it becomes the cost um, because we are we are reshaping the reality of the world we are defining the role of a woman in the society and and for me when I think about it actually I'm, I'm now starting to see it as, as us shaking the world and in a very conservative society like Rwanda where uh, a woman is is expected to be um, extremely feminine uh, and, and never, and, and that, that femi the definition of that femininity is really like a, to never occupy um, a, traditional, a traditional role that is reserved for men, either at home, in the kitchen, uh, at the office, in the church, you know, in, in, even in wedding ceremonies and other public functions. And now we having a young, even like a, another generation that came before us that shaped the way from an educational system because at my mother's uh, time, it was not even allowed for girls to go to school and they have shaped and pushed the boundaries. Um, so for me, uh, now being part of the, the, the younger generation that is like a pushing the boundaries further, um, I would say although Rwanda is becoming more and more open to, um, to more women occupying professional and, and senior professional uh, positions, is and the imposter syndrome is really like a, you know uh, felt in the I would like to exploit it at the feeling level maybe as as a creative writer like how does a woman go home feeling after a productive day at the office because that's why I feel like a societal forces then come to her and then they shape the sense of guilty that she goes 
home with. And for me, that's what I'm trying to like I see changing because I've been feeling that and I'd never even like realized that I was suffering from that until I, I, I hear some conversation then like triggers bigger conversation, bigger conversation. Uh, so for me, I feel like it's like at the feeling level where I feel guilt. Yes, you go to the work and you're productive and then you go home with a sense of uh, guilt because you haven't fulfilled the societal uh, expectations of what a woman can be. Um, and that, that hurts. Uh, in, in the short, in the long run, it hurts the heart of a woman. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm just getting chills because I think that we don't talk enough about these important issues. And what would it be like if we had some version of this conversation each day to just remember, oh, I'm not alone. <laughs> I'm not experiencing this alone. This is um, normal. This is not isolating uh, how much stronger we could be. So Caroline, I have a question for you. I want to first thank everyone for all the really powerful examples of what you've shared and stressing how important it is for us to reframe imposter syndrome. But I wanna ask you, Caroline, Rwanda has been heralded for its progress in achieving gender quotas and political leadership, but many women have shared stories highlighting how more needs to be done. I'm really interested in this because I will admit I too, and books I have written, have heralded Rwanda <laughs> um, based on the numbers I've read. Um, and so I, when I got a chance to meet you in preparation for this call and this too, I'm very hungry for this because it was a lesson too to say, okay, I'm reading these numbers, but you know, what would it be like if I went there um, and had an experience of talking to Rwandan women to learn more? What cultural and workplace challenges beyond individual empowerment, beyond the focus of in individuals, do you think would advance gender equity in the Rwandan context? Do you see a generation of systems minted leaders as a solution? Mm. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and there is a route to uh, our government because they have been like a, a very, very intentional decision of uh, inclusion, gender inclusion. And then the government said, you know, gonna have at least like 30%, uh, if not more, of uh, um, high level positions in all public uh, offices occupied by, by women. And that was a shock. It was a cultural shock. It was a, uh, a political shock because people were like, oh, now we're gonna see what women are capable of. And uh, I think the, the, the consequence then like uh, was there was a pushback that we had now more cases of divorce, for instance, because we had now more women advocating for uh, women rights and uh, you know also contributing to the um, national level uh, decision-making. And uh, Although there have been really some uh, repercussions on, on women, there have also been uh, great um, uh, changes because at the mindset level now people are like, oh, we, we have now, we are now maybe 10, 15 years down the road. Uh, we have more women. Uh, we are now normalizing having women being in, in, in the cabinet, representing the country, uh, their ministers, they are leading, leading a public and uh, even private actually institutions. So now we are normalizing having women in a position of power. And I think that has like a longer term impact sometimes in the short run. Um, uh, it might not be felt as, as powerful as it will in the years to come because now by, by normalizing having women also contributing to the national development and to the, the greatest decision this country is making is Olaka showing a woman has a brain, she has a voice, she has contribution, and she can still be a mom. It doesn't take away her ability to really like, you know, um, uh, be a, a mother at home, a sister, um, a aunt, you name it, but she also can. I, I think that element of redefining the woman's abilities have been like a, the greatest change that we want to see um, happening because there was a, really like a pejorative way of defining what a woman is capable of. Uh, and now that she's showing that uh, yeah, it's possible, highly possible to really like, you know, do, be whatever she wants to be. Uh, it's really like, you know, shaking, um, uh, the reality, but also it's inviting us to, re to redefine what is manhood. Because uh, in, in our traditional society, manhood is the provider, is the thinker, is the doer. And now that we are in, uh, entering this knowledge-based economy, dig digital economy, uh, now we, it's no longer necessarily, you know, based on like a manpower and what much physical work you can do, but uh, really like, you know, how much great thinking you can provide on the table. It's then like a re redefining then what is the contribution of a man in a household in the society and also like what is the uh, contribution of a woman and you like you know now those like forces are redefining themselves and I hope we get there uh, quicker than uh, than than later mm, I like that idea too the redefining the redefining the systems 
um, redefining ourselves and um, doing that together. I can feel the action of that. So Lanice, I have a question for you. What role do male allies play, need to play in progressing gender equity so that they can help us create environments that support the growth of their female peers? And why do you think that mixed gender networks like the GHC community are important for gender equity? Yeah, I think for me, when thinking about the role that male allies play, I would say just a little bit thinking about like my own career path, I can think about a previous job that I had um, with a colleague that was the head of my team. I'm actually still very much in touch with them, very much so senior leader, um, white male, but has been a great champion and advocate for me. And although we no longer work together, he is still um, championing and advocating for me and creating space. So when I think about male allies and the role they can play with the gender equity, I think you know they can really be a vocal champion for women. They can, whether it's within an organization or trying to create one part of systemic change, really opening opportunities for great women leaders, especially women of color. I would say they can also use their privilege to address various gender biases that might arise in the workplace. And I think they can also engage in supportive partnerships for women, whether that's partnering with them, particularly if a woman is hired and being a mentor or a sponsor or partnering with them, particularly if it's on some project type of work. Um, I think also when we think about gender equity, we know that it typically focuses on the fairness of treatment of men and women in all their diversity. And when I say all their diversity, meaning regardless of their sex, their gender identity, gender expression, as well as their sexual um, characteristic. Um, I also think about mixed networks, particularly communities like Global Health Corps. I know it has been really substantial in my um, career trajectory. Um, I see this person is also on the Zoom. I think about, for example, um, John Kate and the role that he has played with either mentoring me or giving me advice or the role that he has played from doing programs with really addressing a lot of the intersectional identities that not only women face, but as well as men. And I think he's a great example of someone that I can think of within the GHC community that really shows what it means to not only be a vocal champion for women, but to use his privilege for good, to address various biases, to create opportunities and create space that women can achieve their full potential and um, move up in the leadership trajectory as well. Thank you so much for illustrating that for us, what those partnerships look like and what they feel like. It's really helpful to think about what we're striving for. And Musanda, as someone who works with young girls and women, where do these cultural shifts need to take place in order to ensure that these issues are addressed early on in a woman's life? Uh, thank you so much, Jamia, once again. I think it's very important that young girls and women firstly see or have access to role models and see women in places that they want to be in. I've always emphasized on how culture just plays um, a major role among young girls in Africa, and it has played a limiting role at an early age because of the teaching around just women not speaking up and just being uh, conservative and not being accepted by society. So there are so much labels that come around being a young person who's very confident enough. And I, just to pick up on what Caroline had said around uh, most women or young girls expected to be very feminine. So speaking up, in, speaking up and being seen as overconfident is seen as a masculine threat. And because in our society, we attach culture so much and we don't want to be seen as the radical or out, outcast, um, young girls and women tend to, you know, adapt to those norms which affects their well-being or whatever ambitions they have in life. Um, uh, for myself, uh, just being part of uh, GHC network has helped me navigate these dynamics. And through the skill set that I've gotten from GHC, it, it's helped me also to navigate and transfer these skills to young girls, knowing that uh, they one day will be in a position like me. And I would like to continue to have continuity in terms of having um, motivated young people who understand that speaking up or being confident 
confident is not a masculine threat, but something that's empowered enough because through those skills, you're able to speak up uh, and, and advocate for issues or any type of social justice that you may experience in society. Thank you so much. I'm getting excited to think about all the people who you are all mentoring and um, helping come along with all of these principles and values too. So thank you for these great insights. It's been amazing to think about these things together, redefining our systems, redefining ourselves, redefining our partnerships and our relationships. So it's very exciting to think about the roadmap we have now with actionable things we can do in our engagements even today and in the days ahead. So now I want to also um, ask another quick question before we transition to Q&A, and this will be more of a lightning round so we can get to everyone's great questions. And that is going to be uh, based on the HBR article and the framing of the last question. So there was a quote that said, as white men progress, their feelings of doubt usually abate their work and intelligence are validated over time. They usually abate as their work and intelligence are validated over time. They're able to find role models who are like them and rarely, if ever, do others question their competence, contributions, or leadership style. Women experience the opposite. So now I'd like to ask our speakers, and we're doing a brief round, what kinds of validations of your strengths, your brilliance, and your work style and your leadership style would be meaningful for you to hear? What aspects of how you operate and what you bring to your work is perhaps not fully appreciated or supported? What would you like to have mirrored back to you? And I can say, um, Caroline, how about you? Because you're the first I see on my screen. That question makes me smile because it's been a journey actually for me. Um, because again, um, I hope this doesn't sound like a controversial, but also like other people can't make us feel the way they do if without our permission uh, has been part of my, 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 my journey. Um, and and, and it's, it was really like, you know, an intrinsic journey that I had to take and like I get my own validation uh, that I belonged because however much praise I could get uh, from the external um, Kong Kong I was I, I was in uh, that little voice that I had really like, you know nurtured as a belief that I didn't belong that I wasn't uh, competent enough that I wasn't confident enough that I should be going back to my house and support my you know any domestic activity that was happening in my home the voice was still in my head and, and I like I had to work hard on on changing the narrative within my head because I realized that like whichever then uh, which whichever beliefs I was hearing they were coming to reinforce the voice that have been installed in, in my head because of uh, the norms that were surrounding my uh, upbringing and then um to, uh, to really like responding to your question, what I would like to see more is women supporting women uh, much more uh, because we are also biased um, uh, subconsciously. And um, the more we really like, you know, overcome these biases and like I know that we have to champion other women and really like, you know, support each other to go higher and higher, uh, the more we are creating space for other women, especially younger women coming. But also the more we like create that uh, um, inner affirmation that we matter and we belong. We came to conquer and we have conquered and we belong and we get like a you know high pace and we deserve that. So the more we get that also like that belief um, reinforced within ourselves, the more we like a work very proudly in these uh, positions and that we continue to to really like a, you know create that impact that we are here to to contribute to. Thank you. And I saw all the nods with women supporting women. So I definitely think that's one of the takeaways when we talk later about us also doing more to do that. Um, so Musanda, Lanise, do you have anything else that you wanna share quickly before we get to the q and I would just say to add to what Caro said, it's just also in addition to women supporting women, just I think a lot of validation that many also women seek that not only that do they belong, but they deserve to be where they are. And it's normal for you to have those moments where you're second guessing the, yourself. 
But in those moments, that's where, you know, you can reach out to your fellow women colleagues or a male ally or champion for you and really use them as a space, as a sounding board to bounce ideas off of. So I would say um, that you belong, that you deserve to be where you are, and that also you are worthy. Beautiful. Yeah, I put in the chats for anyone who needed to hear that today. <laughs> you said it. With Sanda. Yeah, so I totally agree with the women support women. Um, and of course, sometimes as young women, we get carried away with, you know, trying to prove so much to the world. And of course, as women, it's important that we find a more um, inclusive and appropriate way to sort of just get back to the drawing board and think through the process and find out uh, better ways of navigating or letting the message out there based on um, the feedback that you may receive from other women. Excellent advice. And thank you. Thank you so much. You're so wise. And I just popped in some of the wisdom there. I think we should all put those, this wisdom into a post-it note and keep it on our desk when we need a reminder of who we are and why we are here. So now we're going to transition to taking questions and comments from the audience. And please share your questions and comments in the chat. We'll try to get to as many as we can. One of the questions we had before, Chelsea, I promised we were going to get to it, so I'm coming back now, was that the thesis of the HBR article referenced earlier uh, about imposter syndrome, Chelsea's asking, are we doing ourselves a disservice continuing to call it or reference imposter syndrome? I found it hard to openly admit to imposter syndrome with my boss and colleagues because by its nature, imposter syndrome makes you doubt everything and most of all yourself, but that mentally hiding it just perpetuates it. So that was actually answered a little bit in the last section where it was addressed that it's normal to sometimes second guess yourself. And Lenise had said, that's a time when you would go to a champion and talk to them and bounce some ideas. But I wanted to see if you all had any other advice around that as well. And specifically, you know, what, what made you feel like you could be, I mean, and this leads me to think, what made you feel like you could be vulnerable talking about it today in a forum with a lot of people? I think that would be really helpful to share because that might help get to the heart of Chelsea's question for other people who are struggling with being able to talk about this. I can go first. Um, I would say what made me comfortable to share, I'm going to call them Bailey because Bailey was a, um, someone on GHC staff that I had actually reached out to and was having a conversation and just kind of letting her know how I was feeling with the feelings of imposter syndrome. I have, would also say I raised it with a director on my team at work um, who is someone that I really look up to, the first woman of color that at least I know in that level of a position. And um, just her really just reassuring me that, you know, it's normal to have those feelings, but, you know, it was your skills, your experience, the value that you have to add that really brought me to where I am. And I think as individuals, when we are going through things, sometimes it's quite normal that we tend to get quiet. We don't really wanna share with everyone what we are feeling. I also know as another moment of transparency, I did share it with a manager that I had, and I'm still kind of navigating that experience with getting the support that I need, but I've learned that I would say, which I also learned during my GHC year, is how to be really resourceful, right? How to adapt and innovate when you might not be, you might be looking for a certain level of support. Um, some of it might just be management or organizational issues that they really have not thought through about addressing. But I feel like when you're, I've learned to, if I cannot get that level of support, maybe, you know, the person I, my, the manager that I shared it with, maybe she doesn't know how to support me and help me kind of navigate that. So I've just learned how to reach out to other people, use them kind of as a sounding board to just really navigate um, what I'm feeling in just really ways that, you know, I do it a lot to myself, really speak words of affirmation and validation to remind myself kind of what I said that I am worthy that I belong here. I would think all of us, especially if you watch last week, the um, 
Supreme Court confirmation hearing for um, Judge Katandri Brown Jackson, we heard those same words. I would say when Cory Booker spoke to her, it really hit me deep in my soul. So it was kind of like, that's what I've been waiting to hear this whole, this whole time. And I think it's just really rem reminding yourself that you are where you are for a reason. It's not by coincidence. And again, it's normal to have these feelings where you're second guessing yourself, but don't let those moments um, hinder you from seeking the help that you might need or talking to someone for, to help you really talk through the feelings that you're trying to figure out and navigate in that moment. It's really powerful. And I love that you brought up Cory Booker. I heard a friend say that he was the only one who understood the assignment last week. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, yes, you know, that that if we could see that kind of support um, in all of our systems, the world would be a better place. So Caroline, Musanda, do you have do you have any thoughts to share with Chelsea as well about how we can normalize talking about this subject, but also, you know, maybe some ways that um, you have been encouraged to, to speak up about this experience as well, or to be vulnerable with your voice. What brought you to speak today? Yeah, I can go first. Uh, so what brought me to speak today is actually like a, it, uh, I'm now working as a consultant and uh, at my office we host uh, professional network events every Thursday. And then I, I didn't realize it, but uh, for a couple of uh, weeks, I had been just like, you know, hesitant to talk about what I do. And for me, I called it humility because I wanted to connect with people around me. And then one of my colleagues who is the founder of the space came to me and said, like, Carol, I realize that you don't talk about what you do. Are you ashamed of what you do? I'm actually not ashamed at all, but I realize that now uh, holding a title of a consultant, uh, which is like really comes with so much um, high expectations, was again to really like you know affect my like how the outer world perceives me, and I hadn't even realized that I was hiding. Uh, behind not really like talking about what I'm doing. And when he told me that, I was like, oh my God, uh, this is like, I can't be suffering from imposter syndrome because if I'm perceived among uh, as one of the um, accomplished Rwandan women, and I feel this way, uh, how, we, how are like other women around me feeling? You know, I, I'm really like, I, I, I tend to bring intentional conversations around and I was like, if I feel this way, what uh, does that mean uh, to other women uh, that are maybe like a younger professionals who are looking up to us? And that's why like I just reached out and like, you know, the conversation like I was uh, uh, suggested and read the article, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and it's so subconscious, I don't even know that I'm really experiencing that. Um, and, and, and I realized that, you know, there's so much, uh, I wish there was not so much in our work to do, like in terms of reaffirming yourself and uh, uh, reassuring yourself. And uh, for me, like uh, before we wait for like a really like a systemic change, um, what I'm realizing is that like, uh, there's also like a, that need for um, what is the work that I'm doing, like uh, while I'm preparing my day so that I really like, I feel um, the best I can uh, with all the responsibility that comes within a, a, a professional day. Because also like what I advocate for, for me is like a women to work, um, contribute and well and feel well uh, about their contribution. Because you can have spent um, a very busy day and then go home where you're supposed to be resting and then like, end up feeling guilty that you are actually doing the great thing that you are meant to be and to do. Thank you so much, Musanda. Yeah, so for me, um, I'm here because um, part of my journey in life for the past four years, I've been working with young people to kind of just get them to places where they're supposed to be, only because I have a similar story with them. So I'll do a short story, hope we have enough time, but I am naturally a loud person. And when I interviewed for my job, I remember reaching out to my friends and colleagues who were telling me how I should act in the interview because there was no need for me to have dark humor or just you know be too loud, but more modest. Um, fast forward, when I did my interview, I just felt I needed to be the person that I am, loud enough, and fortunately, 
Um, that's what my organization was looking for because of the energy that uh, I had rubbed off to the panel and also seeing that uh, they were working towards building a generation that's uh, self-motivated. So for me, I saw an opportunity to not only share my story, but meet, meet other people who are, of course, in a similar journey or working with other young people organization in ensuring that we talk about this more and create more safe spaces in understanding that, you know, it's okay sometimes to doubt yourself, but also you don't need sometimes words of affirmation to get to where you are, like be who you are, stand up in that place, because I mean, like I've emphasized enough, that's the only way you can advocate for yourself. I like that. So wait, I'm going to just reflect that back to you. Be who you are, stand up for yourself, because that's the only way you can advocate for yourself. It's another post-it note after this call I'm going to put on my desk. And I just, you're all so wise. And thank you so much for the amazing work that you do, the themes that we've discussed today both weaving in your experiences, but also some actionable ways that we can change the systems, that we can uh, also evolve and grow within ourselves, but also to nurture ourselves. Really love that Caroline talked about rest and talked about healing. I think there has been so much conversation about burnout. I've been seeing that in publishing a lot that, you know, there's a lot of books about burnout and people wanting to write about burnout and work from home. Does it mean that burnout is happening less or more and all of those big questions? So I also appreciate you mentioning all of the aspects of our lives, how we are taking care of our bodies, our spirits and our minds and our relationships as we're working together. Um, one thing that came to mind hearing all of your very wise experiences and words was this quote I'd read from Mindy Kaling um, just this week. I love her for others who um, I think of her as a leader who has also been someone who has done a lot of things in a male dominated industry and changing culture on her own terms. And she said that a lot of people have asked her, oh, is it that you just think you're all that, that you just think you're the best, that you think you're so good. And her response was this, I just don't hate myself. I do idiotic things all the time and I say things that I regret, but I don't let everything traumatize me. And the scary thing I've noticed is that some people really feel uncomfortable around women who don't hate themselves. So that's why you need to be a little bit brave. So that really spoke to me <laughs> on a number of levels as a woman who I think some people get mad at because I don't hate myself um, and thinking about what it would mean to kind of reverse that, to say, what is a loving thing I'm doing for myself today at work? What is a loving thing I'm doing for my body, for my mind, for my relationship with my manager? So what you all were speaking to that gave me a lesson for myself to really tune in and I think, oh, I'm going to start asking myself what it's a loving thing that I can do because that will reverberate outward in terms of how I manage my assistant, how I work with other people in the team. So I just wanted to share that um, because I think that it also acknowledges that we do have to be brave to be vulnerable um, and to be able to also push beyond the individual to transform systems. We have to be brave enough to see and imagine something that we haven't seen in every case done yet. So I just wanna thank everybody who came today to this conversation to speak, the leadership of GHC, the team, each of you speakers, um, also for each of you who showed up and who were brave enough to imagine leadership and connection and community in ways where we are systems-minded, in ways where we are redefining, in ways where we're inclusive. So the call to action that we would like for us to think about is to think about how you've used the term imposter syndrome as it relates to other young women in your life or your workplace. And then think about how you might be able to challenge that and instead create more inclusion and belonging to allow more women to thrive. So that's just one thing to uh, think about. And if you have if you have another question, you know you can pop that in. We still have some time. If there's another question anyone has, um, 
And one thing I'd like to add to that is how can you challenge that and create more inclusion and belonging to allow more women to thrive today? What's the thing you could do today at whatever your time zone is before you go to bed um, that can do that? What's the thing you can do tomorrow? What's a thing that you could do in a week, in a month, in six months, and a year? Because it, it helps me to set goals in that way, um, even for big ideas and visions. So that's something I would like for you to think about. What's something I could do today and then tomorrow? Because the research shows that to develop a habit, it has to be consistent. So us making a habit of practicing all the wisdom that's been shared to, with us today from Caroline and Lanice and Musanda and Heather and Bailey and the team. Uh, all of that we'll take with us and we'll be able to bring others as well. So in the last five minutes before we go and say goodbye, is there anyone who'd like to come off mute and share? A takeaway you've learned or anything that you wanna to bring to everybody? And it's okay if you're deep listening. I will say that too. You know, one of the practices is deep listening. So if you're deep listening right now, that's great too. And I just want to reflect back some of the things I'm seeing in the chat because they're beautiful. This was great from Ashley. I never thought about imposter syndrome as anything other than my problem. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I mean, that really got me in the heart. Um, I was in a healing circle once and I had 300 women in a inner faith group that I was a part of. And each of us got a chance to be in the circle. And there were all these indigenous grandmothers. And what they would do is that they would just walk in the circle and everyone was connected with their hands around each other. And you would go into the center of the circle and they would say, your wound is our wound. I can't begin to tell you what a life-changing experience that was to have that to be held by hundreds of women in a circle saying that to me. I wept like a baby after that, um, never slept as well again in my life. But I just want to say that to you, Ashley, next time you feel like this is your problem or the burden on your back, just like stand up each vertebrae to reach vertebrae up straight and imagine everyone on this call, putting their arms around you saying your wound is our wound. You are not alone. It is not your problem. It is the burden for all of us to transform the system. So each of us are included and each of us belong. And I love this note of nat gratitude from Nancy. I'm so grateful to GHC for organizing this critically needed conversation in a safe and transparent environment. Many thanks to the informative and insightful moderator. Oh, thank you. And speakers <laughs> for sharing and causing great change. Right back at you, Nancy. The light you see in us is your light reflected right back at you. I'm so glad to be here and it's been a real blessing to be in conversation with everyone here today. And I would just like to, as I thank you all for engaging us on this topic, to encourage you to reach out to the GHC team if you would like to be in dialogue on what a systems approach to gender equity for closing the gender gap in global health leadership would look and feel like for you. I hope and wish that each of you have a beautiful, beautiful day and week ahead, that each of you and your families are safe. And I also want to thank GHC for the work you do to make this world better and for creating more healthy workplaces, more healthy relationships and more healthy humans. So thank you all and sending you off with great takeaways. And if you wanna continue the conversation, go on Twitter, follow at GHCore and retweet and share the wisdom of Lanice, Caroline and Masenda today. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead.